to set the stage as we continue in this season of Easter. Today we are turning to the Gospel of Luke. And Luke's Gospel tells the story of that first Easter by telling us that the stone was rolled away and there were only linen cloths left behind. There was no body. The women who had gone to the tomb that morning with spices were left perplexed. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them told the 11 disciples and all the rest about their experience. Those things that Jesus had told them before he died, what they encountered at the tomb that morning, a missing body and two men in dazzling clothes. Now it appears that the disciples weren't sure what to think about, the what, about what the women said. Luke tells us that Peter got up and ran to the tomb himself to see the linen cloths there by themselves, and he went home amazed. Before we continue on this journey in Luke 24, let us pray. Holy and magnificent God, by your incarnation, death, and resurrection, you transform us and give us new life. As we hear your scripture read this morning, give us new eyes to see, new ears to hear, new minds to understand, and new hearts to yearn. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we recognize your presence among us in these ancient words. Amen. From Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, I invite you to listen for God's word to you this day. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, 
while he was opening up the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The walk to Emmaus is a familiar story to many of us, but it is one of the wordier accounts of the risen Lord. And so here is the walk to Emmaus in 50 words. Two traveling, Jesus coming, no recognizing, stranger asking, disciples frowning, Cleopas questioning, man curious, disciples summarizing, mighty prophet, leaders condemning, Jesus crucified, people hoping, women astounding, angels proclaiming, tomb empty, Jesus speaking, foolish naming, Jesus interpreting, disciples inviting, stranger staying breaking, blessing, eyes opening, disciples recognizing, Jesus vanishing, hearts burning. What's missing in the story? Well, it starts with a missing body, but then it seems to be understanding that's missing. Or is it trust that's missing? Or belief. What we can see with the two disciples on that road is that what is very present as they walk along is their sadness, their dashed hopes, their astonishment. They also are incredulous that this stranger among them doesn't seem to understand what it is they are discussing. After all, now there are multiple reports coming from this group and that group that there is a missing body. On that road to Emmaus that first Easter day, the disciples were distracted by the things that had taken place in Jerusalem those days. They were distracted by all of the news headlines coming their way. They were caught up in their own feelings about it and couldn't make sense of what they knew in their heads and what they were hearing from others. It was so perplexing. I think it's incredibly easy for the same thing to happen to us. Each day, if we open a newspaper or turn on our computer or scroll through the headlines on our phone, the costs of healthcare in our country continue to skyrocket, and it's often the most vulnerable that have the hardest time. Ukraine is fighting for its very life. Today marks six months of Israel and Hamas at war with so much violence and so many dead. It's 2024 and people are going hungry in the world while there is enough food for all. And aid workers are killed by bombs. In our own country, there are fears of the presidential election to come And our fears continue to push us farther and farther apart. Migrant children get caught up in our disagreements. A 7.4 earthquake rattles Taiwan. And abortion rulings continue in our country, putting women and their doctors in very difficult positions. So it's easy to get caught up in the headlines to get distracted by all the news and then wonder, where is Jesus in all this? Where is our God of justice, love, and peace? Where is the Holy Spirit showing us the way, active in the world and empowering us to act? Is God missing? 
where do we begin to look for God in this world? Pastor and author Barbara Brown Taylor has an answer to this question. In the opening pages of her book, An Altar in the World, she writes about how we humans tend to look all over for God. In our prayers, we seek God. We visit monasteries. We go on mission trips. We go far and wide looking for God. She writes, the last place most people look is right under their feet. In everyday activities, accidents, and encounters of their lives. No one longs for what he or she already has, and yet the accumulated insight of those wise about the spiritual life suggests that the reason so many of us cannot see the red X that marks the spot is because we are standing on it. The treasure we seek requires no lengthy expedition, no expensive equipment, no superior aptitude or special company. All we lack is the willingness to imagine that we already have everything we need. The only thing missing is our consent to be where we are. If Cleopas and the other disciple had used their GPS tracking device to find Jesus and his cell phone, they would have been shocked to see the red blinking dot of Jesus right next to their blue dot on the map. Jesus was there walking with them. The X marks the spot. Look down under your feet. Jesus is there. But hindsight is always 2020, right? Oh, yes, when we think back, Jesus was there. Weren't our hearts burning within us while he talked to us and interpreted the scriptures for us? Jesus was with them. His resurrection transformed him, and it changed the disciples too. No more was Jesus just in the flesh, a mortal being, a mighty prophet in three dimensions. Now Jesus was ethereal, mysterious, even more multidimensional. Was he now 4D or 5D? Or did his dimensions now reach all the way to infinity? Resurrection had transformed Jesus and the world. Theologian Elizabeth Johnson says this about resurrection changing things. The resurrection starts on earth with Jesus dead and buried and ends up in God with Jesus the living one transformed by the power of the spirit. Alive in God, his presence is no longer bound by earth's limits, but partakes of the omnipresence of God's own love. Christ is now present in word and sacrament wherever two or three are gathered in his name. True to the pattern of his ministry, he also approaches, mysteriously revealed and concealed in the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, the homeless, those in prison, the very least of these. Ultimately, through the power of the Spirit, Jesus is with the whole community of disciples, indeed with the whole community of creation, through every hour until the end of time. Does the resurrection of Jesus give him the ability or the authority to be with us in all times and places? What does it mean for the world in which we live, the world all around us? There's a beautiful song written by Peter Mayer called Holy Now. And in it, he reveals how holy things aren't confined to a church or to a priest or a pastor or even the sacramental bread and cup. Everything is holy now, he sings. He sings about being in Sunday school as a boy, learning about Moses splitting the Red Sea and Jesus turning the water to wine. He was sad because miracles don't happen anymore. 
But now he realizes miracles are all around him. Everything is holy now. The bridge of the song goes like this. Wine from water is not so small, but an even better magic trick is that anything is here at all. So the challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles, but finding where there isn't one. Everything is holy now. Jesus is with us in the hospital or rehab room. When we go and visit with prisoners, Jesus is there too. Jesus is with us when we stop to talk to someone who lives on the streets. Jesus is in the family seeking asylum. Jesus is with the person sitting alone at the lunch table or the person who feels alone in a sea of people. Jesus is in Israel. Jesus is in Gaza. Jesus is in Taiwan and Ukraine. Jesus is wherever we find ourselves. When we see a bluebird singing on a spring day as the flowers bud and the sun shines bright, we are reminded everything is holy now. Jesus is here. In the words of Old Turtle by Douglas Wood, God is deep and much higher than high. He is swift and free as the wind and still and solid as a great rock. She is the life of the world always close by, yet beyond the farthest twinkling light. God is gentle and powerful above all things and within all things. Everything is holy now. It was at that table that evening with common bread and the ritual of the blessing and breaking of the bread that the disciples' eyes opened to the stranger among them. It wasn't a stranger after all that they had invited to stay for dinner. It was Jesus. It was the very one they had hoped would redeem Israel he was there with them. What did it mean? At the table, it was after the bread was broken, and then they remembered his words. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And isn't this why we come to church and why we gather at the table and break bread together? It's to remember, to remember the stories of our ancestors, the stories of our faith, the stories that remind us that Moses met God in a burning bush and God told him, you are standing on holy ground. The X marks the spot. The stories we remember that recall the goodness of creation the gift of manna in the wilderness, the land flowing with milk and honey, the baby born in Bethlehem fulfilling all that the prophets had foretold. We remember Jesus' words about love and service to our neighbor, about forgiveness and healing. We remember the way that Jesus looked at people with compassion and taught about the way to new life. We remember the way Jesus sought peace and justice without using a weapon, the way Jesus was crucified and died. We remember those first accounts of the empty tomb, the accounts that proclaim the stone had been rolled away and the body of Jesus was missing. Jesus is missing, they said. He is not there. If we want to know God, if we want to see God, then we have to be willing to gather with the community to remember. We have to be willing to embrace all of God's people, to listen with compassion, to enter into conversations with an expectation that God can open our eyes. We have to be humble and patient and ready because everything is holy now. 
everything, everything, everything. So what's missing? For the disciples that first Easter morning, it was the body of Jesus. But today, on this second Sunday of Easter, you are the one missing. You are missing from your bed right now. You are missing from the brunch table across town. You are missing from the yoga class. You won't be found at your work desk right now, where there are surely dozens of to-dos calling your name. You are missing from your yard doing some work. You're missing from the grocery store. You're missing from the soccer field. You are missing from all of these places, these good and fine and even holy places, because you chose to be here this morning. You chose community. You chose to be a part of the gathered community of faith that remembers the acts of God, the community that needs your insights and your questions, the community that celebrates the light of Christ in you, that wants to make a difference in the community and the world, that comes together for support, that grieves and prays and celebrates and vows and gives witness to new life. The community that blesses and breaks bread together. You chose to gather with the community of faith who can help pull you away from the news of the day and remind you where Jesus is in the midst of it. Right here. Right there. Right everywhere. Everything is holy now. And that includes you and this gathered community, and the work we do here, and the calling we seek to live out every day. Everything is holy now. In the breaking of the bread today, may our eyes be opened, that we might be transformed to see Jesus here with us, walking with us, in the world around us, in the faces of our neighbors, and in every encounter with another living being or part of creation. Jesus is with us. May we be expectant and ready. Amen.